Coming up, Inside Indiana Business is on the road, exploring Northwest Indiana. South Shoreline West Lake Corridor is built as the project of a generation here, creating a crucial Hoosier gateway in Chicago. Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority CEO Bill Hanna is here to talk about the South Shore and other big projects remaking the region. Plus, for more than a century, the steel industry has employed thousands and served as the backbone of the Northwest Indiana economy. From U.S. Steel's largest domestic mill, Gary Works, to Arcelor Middle's Indiana Harbor Complex in East Chicago, the largest integrated steel making facility in North America. Steel is still very important here, but a different industry. We'll look at what's next. And two soccer moms created Portage-based Bee Nutty, a gourmet peanut butter company that outgrew its humble beginnings in a kitchen and is now expanding and investing nearly $2 million with plans to create 100 new jobs. They are here to share their story and their vision. Details on those stories and much more ahead on this special edition of Inside Indiana Business on the Road. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Inside Indiana Business. I'm Gary Dick on the road in Northwest Indiana, coming to you from the Mascot Hall of Fame in Whiting. We'll tell you more about this very unique addition to Northwest Indiana a little bit later in this broadcast. But this uh, museum is reflective, I think, of a changing region, the state's second largest regional economy, the industrial heart of Indiana, now taking on a new direction. Grit, hard work, and heavy industry have been the region's calling cards for well over 100 years, since the arrival of industrial giants like U.S. Steel and Standard Oil. Industrial might that helped build America, attracting workers from around the world, forming a melting pot of ethnicities that remains an important part of the fabric of the region today. Northwest Indiana was hit hard by the nation's manufacturing transition, its perception long framed as a Rust Belt region losing jobs and population. But for the first time in nearly a decade, there are signs of significant economic improvement and growth here and an economy in transition. While manufacturing still drives the economy, the region's tourism industry is growing, fueled by the Indiana Dunes designation as a national park, a first for Indiana. The $300 million Hard Rock Casino in Gary is part of a gaming industry that generates hundreds of millions of dollars in economic impact. And people are moving into the region as communities like Whiting, Valparaiso, Hammond, and Michigan City are making major investments in downtown redevelopment and quality of place, attracting new residents from the Chicago suburbs. A region with a proud past is embracing change in hopes of a promising future. Well, a long talk about project that some say uh, could transform the region is the southward expansion of the South Shore Line Westlake Corridor project, and it's now one step closer to becoming reality. Now, the project uh, would include four new stations along an eight-mile extension between Hammond and Dyer, and importantly, it would mean better uh, connectivity, access to Chicago. I'm pleased to welcome back to the show Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority President and CEO Bill Hanna to explain what's next for this generational project, as well as uh, some other developments uh, in the region. And Bill, as always, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about the South Shore Line because that is such an important project. It's yeah. been talked about for many, many years. But as you look at the overall health of the region, mm -hmm. the regional economy, how would you uh, assess the state of Northwest Indiana? Yeah, you know, really, it's never been better. Um, we went through a period of struggle there of course with uh, industrial decline and a lot of it had to do with productivity too so I feel like the steel industry and BP are more competitive than they've ever been um, but we're learning also to adjust to some of the changes there in terms of employment mm -hmm. and so I think we've um, postured ourselves as the new uh, suburban opportunity around Chicago and that's a game changer for us. Yeah and you talk about that changing workforce and you mm -hmm. talk about the steel industry uh, tens of thousands of jobs high paying jobs over the yeah. year a lot of those have gone away still very important here mm -hmm. but it's it's a, a 
different mix, uh, service industry jobs and some others as well. Yeah, it really is. I, you know, when I was a kid, my dad, being a 35-year steel worker, used to be proud about the fact that it was between seven and 10 jobs supported by the mm -hmm. steel industry. And that's changed somewhat. As you said, it's still a powerhouse. It's a global connection. Um, but I think, um, you know, looking at um, diversity and professional jobs, that's changed a lot and it's been on the rise. Um, tapping into our educational institutions like IU and Purdue that, that are up here and some of the benefits that come from that has become uh, bigger and stronger. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, um, tapping into the third largest economy in the country in a place that has as many jobs as the state of Indiana, Chicago, Illinois, is yeah. going to be huge for us. Yeah, well, let's talk about that because a project that can do that uh, is the South Shore Extension, that eight mile uh, extension between uh, Dyer and Hammond, been talked mm -hmm. about for more than three decades. For those outside of the region, talk about what this extension uh, means. There's also a double right. tracking of the South Shore that could have impact all the way to South Bend. You know, you think about public transit and it's really not primarily focused on that. This is about economic development and reducing time to market. So the impact really is about um, two things, taking people to work and then bringing people here to increase our population. We've had areas that have had decline in population in the north uh, since the 70s and some growth in the south, um, but this is going to help um, change the direction of what people are thinking about in terms of living opportunities within Northwest Indiana. Well, let's talk about that because I think that's part of the changing uh, of Northwest Indiana and what communities uh, are doing here. We're here in Whiting is an example, East Chicago, Valparaiso, mm -hmm. a number of these communities making quality of life improvements, uh, housing improvements that can yeah. attract people from uh, Chicago. Yeah, that's really it. So we had an economic development model for a long time, which we still do in support of industry, which is really about attracting industry from Illinois and other places and incenting them to come across the border. And the realization came in, in, in just looking at other areas where real estate values and attractiveness to people really has to be a part of what we're doing here. You can't really run the business of government without showing positive uh, increase of population. That's ultimately our goal. And so we've changed our approach, and you see these communities as partners here in Whiting, as you said, Valparaiso, Ham, and other places where the mayors and uh, community leaders are, are partnering with the RDA to improve the quality of life and make some very attractive features, whether it's on the lakeshore or downtowns, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. Bill Hanna is the CEO of the Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority. Bill, uh, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for hosting us here uh, this week. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. All right. Well, up next, for more than 40 years, this region has earned its reputation as the nation's steel-making capital, home to the largest steel mill in the country. But a downturn in several key sectors of the economy could challenge steel's stronghold in the region. We'll have details coming up. Well, BP's Whiting Refinery is marking 130 years of operations this year. It is BP's largest refinery in the world, pumping out products ranging from gasoline to jet fuel. The Whiting Refinery can produce enough gasoline each day to support the average daily travel of more than 7 million cars. Wow. The refinery also produces about 7% of all asphalt in the U.S. BP supports more than 12,000 jobs in the state of Indiana. Well, since the turn of the 20th century, steel has been the economic driver for Northwest Indiana. The region is home to the biggest steel mills, and Indiana has led the nation in steel production for more than four decades. The steel business has meant jobs for the area, once employing 30,000 plus workers. That number now is down to maybe around 15,000. Automation and advancements in technology reshaping the industry. And for some perspective on the state of steel in Northwest Indiana, I'm pleased to be joined by one of the foremost authorities on the industry here in the region, Joe Pete. He's a business reporter for a partner to the Times of Northwest Indiana. Joe, welcome to the program. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, to give people an idea, I think you look at Northwest Indiana and that people think steel from around the state. But put in perspective how important that industry still is today, but has been over many, many decades. Ever since they started to build the steel mills at the dawn of the 20th century, like it's just been a central economic driver. This was the last area of the state to become uh, populated, but what really drove the uh, drove the population boom here initially was the steel mills that U.S. Steel and uh, Inland Steel and Bethlehem and all the other old steel companies came and put in. It's been said at various points that everyone in Northwest Indiana knew someone who worked 
within uh, the steel industry, whether it was a f family member, a friend, a classmate, um, it just had a connection to everybody's life. At one point, you've seen stuff where like 100 different languages were supposed to, supposedly spoken in Indiana Harbor and in East Chicago at one point, but it really brought the world to Northwest Indiana because they were they needed so much labor initially in the day, early in the But it's a very different industry, as you know today. Technology, innovation has changed things. It's reduced the employment by a lot, but it's still, still important here. Oh, absolutely. Yes, um, there have been, uh, the industry has contracted a lot nationally. Many mills, which had accounted for maybe like 15% of the production during the um, 70s and now account for like 70% of the production today. Nucor has long since surpassed U.S. Steel as the largest steel maker. Automation has really reduced the headcount at the mills, like in a lot of manufacturing. Um, you used to have 30,000 people per mill, and now totally the employment is down to about 15,000. There have been a lot of um, overseas uh, foreign steel dumping in the area that's helped reduce like the market share. Foreign steel now ac accounts for like 20 to 30 percent of the domestic market and it's just uh, taken a toll on the amount of employment in the. How would you assess this, the, the state of the industry and where things are going? You know, as you said, so important for so many uh, decades. Uh, a lot of question marks. You've got the tariff issue, innovation, the changing dynamics in the market. How would you assess steel and the future of the industry here in Northwest Indiana? The, there was a slight benefit from the Section 232 uh, tariffs last year. You saw um, increases in prices and profitability. A lot of that has since worn off. But you have uh, U.S. Steel is currently investing $750 million into Gary Works. Uh, you've seen some large capital investments. Um, ArcelorMittal continues to invest in uh, talent development. They are uh, they have the Steelworker for the Future program. They're investing in STEM programs in the schools. However, there are many ongoing threats and challenges. Uh, Bank of America analyst is warning about a steel Mageddon in the next couple years because all these mini mills are investing billions of dollars in what will be close to 18 to 20 million tons of new capacity. And they're saying a lot of the older steel mills, you know, it's going to affect a lot of the older steel mills are going to have to take capacity offline. Um, their imports continue to be an issue. You've seen um, U.S. Steel has now idled blast furnace number eight at Gary Works and then East Chicago Tin, not far from where we're sitting right now, that, that was recently idled and half the workers there, about 150 were laid off. So there are um, a lot of challenges, but steel is notoriously a very cyclical industry. It's very boom or bust. Um, the market conditions can change quickly. But uh, we have a lot of older steel mills here, and that is a concern, especially at a time when there's a lot of uh, newer investment going on in steel making capacity around the country. Joe Pete is a business reporter for our partners at the Times of Northwest Indiana. Joe, thanks very much for some great perspective. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Well, next, while steel has been uh, really king of the hill for decades here, other industries are beginning to help drive the Northwest Indiana economy. We'll learn what they are and how they're growing plus the latest on some workforce development issues as well. Stay with us. Well, Gary Chicago International Airport bills itself as the third airport for the Chicago metro area. It covers more than 700 acres with two runways. It is home to more than 110 aircraft and an Army aviation support facility. Boeing, Menards, and White Lodging Services, just a few of the companies that base their corporate fleets at the airport. Its nearly 9,000 uh, foot runway is the longest in the region other than O'Hare. A year ago, the airport opened a U.S. Customs and Border Protection facility as well. Well, Northwest Indiana is the state's second largest regional economy, and as we mentioned, the steel industry has served as its backbone for more than four decades. But there are other emerging economic drivers, like a $40 million data center planned for Hammond, which is targeting companies like Amazon and Hulu. Workforce development will be key in filling these new economy jobs. And joining us now to explain more about the region's changing workforce, please do be joined by Center for Workforce Innovation's CEO, Linda Wolshansky. Linda, as always, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. You bet. Um, let's talk about uh, the, the, the changing uh, face of the economy and the workforce here in Northwest Indiana. The steel industry is still very important. Advanced manufacturing, very important. Is it beginning to diversify? Yes, the economy is beginning to shift with the data center that is here. Healthcare is picking up a lot of steam, which also technology plays a uh, key part to that. And, you know, we do see stronger logistics and the uh, tourism and hospitality industry also is beginning to, to influence uh, the workforce and talent development. Again, I've said a number of times, steel very important, still in advanced manufacturing. Uh, 
and it sounds like the steel companies and others are really making concerted effort, even into the high schools, uh, to, to, to focus on science, technology, engineer, in, engineering, and math, those STEM uh, fields, and, and, and training uh, a workforce for that modern economy. You know, our career and technical education centers are really working closely with the industries and in beginning to take a look at how they can provide more advanced classes for students, which are getting filled. I mean, the students are really responding well to this, and we're seeing a lot of early college connections as well, which, you know, with Vincennes and Ivy Tech, which then bodes well for our, our university enrollments and continuation of skill development. It's been tremendous to see the connections that they're making with businesses and, and doing so in such a way that their curriculum is beginning to change and they're changing their whole methods in terms of the development of their programming. And it is really you know, focused on those uh, STEAM mm -hmm. jobs, so to speak, mm -hmm. and um, you know, really looking at um, information technology with which IUN and Valparaiso University is very strong in. As you look at that transition from a traditional manufacturing economy to maybe more service, the uh, uh, healthcare, is it difficult? I mean, some areas it's, it's tough to transition from that and the, the wage disparity can be a challenge. Is it a tough transition? You know, the transition in healthcare is not tough at all. Um, where the transition is tough is really taking a look at the information technology area because people here do not see a lot of IT companies located here, corporate headquarters or a lot of talk about jobs. But what we know is that so many of the jobs today really require IT skills. And so that's where we have a challenge and we're starting to put um, efforts on helping people understand how they could really advance with those those skills. As we look at the future of, of the workforce here, efforts to attract people from Chicago uh, and other places here, how does that play into the mix? You know, interestingly enough, the placemaking efforts are helping with all of that because of the changes in many of our communities, making them more attractive, and also then um, mm -hmm. the dual tracking Mm -hmm. um, effort that's going so on sure, is, yeah. is bringing people here as well, as well as keeping people here in Northwest Indiana who otherwise might have gone to uh, Chicago to work are now staying here. Yeah. Linda Wallachansky, the CEO Thank of the Center you. for Workforce it's Innovations. Good to Thanks talk very to you. much for some great perspective. Thank you so much. All right. Well, coming up next, uh, what started in a soccer mom's kitchen five years ago has blossomed into a multi-million dollar success story. The women behind Be Nutty tell us about their wildly popular peanut butter product and a new headquarters in Portage that plans for expansion. Well, after Clyde McMillan was hurt in a fire using an ineffective nozzle, a simple sketch on a napkin resulted in the idea for Task Force Tips. Nearly 50 years later, Valparaiso-based TFT now designs, manufactures, and delivers innovative high-performance products and agent uh, delivery solutions to emergency responders all over the globe. TFT combines extensive engineering, precise manufacturing, and support to help customers save lives. The company started in the McMillan family basement in 1971 with total sales of less than $14,000. Ten years ago, TFT moved into its new world headquarters, and this year is expected to generate more than $60 million in sales. Well, Portage-based Bee Nutty was founded in 2014 to raise money for a local youth soccer club. Today, the entrepreneurial venture has 15 full-time employees and is expanding. The company plans to create up to 100 new jobs by 2021 and invest nearly $2 million into a new facility. The all-natural uh, artisanal peanut butter company is sold across northwest Indiana and Illinois, as well as at Walmart on QVC as well. And joining me now to talk about this uh, entrepreneurial success story, pleased to be joined by owners Joy Tompkins and Carol Podolak. And ladies, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. And congrats on the success. This is, uh, uh, again, both soccer moms here, right? And yeah. the whole idea was to create some product, fundraising product for the soccer club, right, in 2014. Absolutely. Yeah, as you we'll talk about those early days, and uh, it started in, in your kitchen, literally, right? What was that like? Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you've ever done fundraising before, you know that it involves a lot of time and commitment, mm -hmm. and you're always trying to get your kids to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose. So, we were doing a lot of traveling for the soccer club across the nation, and we were coming up on our first time going to uh, Dallas, Texas for the Copa. Yep, the Copa Cup. Yep. And so, 
we had done a fundraiser and I was leading it for my son's team and we had done it through a local company and he was selling like garbage bags and pretzels. Well, it was great, he sold a lot of money, but the pretzels come in boxes this big and the garbage bags come in boxes that weigh about five pounds a piece and then I realized, this is my job. Yeah. I have to be the one to drive it around. And so it just kind of happened that mm -hmm. I'm a nurse by my former education, and I realized that what we were doing, stopping on the road, was eating a lot of junk food, a lot of food and snacks that really mm -hmm. weren't healthy or conducive to the game. Yeah. And if you want a good outcome in the game, you've got to fuel your body right. Yeah. And so peanut butter just seemed like a natural thing, yeah. and we started doing it, started making it home, and then thought, well, let's just do this like a Girl Scouts yeah. and do it once a year, yeah. and we'll work really hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it'll be once a year. Yeah. <laughs> once a year. And, Let me say that again. And Carol, once that's how she she got you in yeah. as a partner, right? Saying it was only going to be once a year, but that it quickly is. became more than that. <laughs> Talk about the growth and the traction, how it, it really gained in popularity. Yeah, so when we first got started, again, that was our whole business plan. Once a year, we're going to make peanut butter, we're going to sell it, it's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. Fun was our big fun, buzzword. Yeah. We're going to yeah. have so much fun doing this. People fall in love with it, you know, with our interesting flavors and our different twists on gourmet mm -hmm. peanut butter. When you pair things like pretzels and white chocolate with honey roasted peanuts, or my personal favorite, totally toffee, toffee bits and milk chocolate, people fall in love. So we decided we'd do it once a season, which if, if you're a soccer fan, you know that soccer goes year round, so that's four times a year. <laughs> Turned into once a month, um, and then suddenly we found ourselves every weekend with a group of soccer players at local farmers markets, selling all the peanut butter we brought. The boys were traveling a little further, so we were funding trips to Florida and Nevada and California. Yeah. Um, from there, a few local store shelves offered us some space as we grew into the store shelves and we started working with places like Wiseway Markets here in Indiana, Strack and Vantel, a Northwest Indiana chain of yeah. grocers, um, we ended up getting picked up by QVC. And wow. from there, things really, yeah. pun intended, they got nuttier. Yeah, got nuttier, <laughs> yeah. And so QVC also selects stores in Walmart all over uh, the country. You announced expansion plans uh, not long ago. Talk about that, a new facility headquarters uh, in Portage. So we've been in business for about five years, and the first couple years I really kind of discount. It was a lot of just experience. And then when we moved into what we thought was too big to imagine, it was 2,000 square feet, we quickly moved out of that. We were renting four different units there, running across the parking lot. It wasn't a good flow. And so we started looking for someplace else in the region, and Portage welcomed us with open arms, and we've been very, very happy. We've been there almost a year. Yeah. But now we have plenty of space, and we are constantly expanding, and pushing our borders and learning more things. All right, let's, as we wrap up, let's talk about what's next because as I mentioned, national distribution and you continue to grow. Uh, what's next from a growth standpoint? Oh, wow, so we've been really excited. I mean, our partnership with QVC has expanded what used to be every few months. We're on a few times a month right now. We're, we've moved on to about 3,000 grocery store shelves across the country. Um, we're currently growing our corporate gift basketing division. We're starting to do a lot of gift baskets and um, some snack size and travel size. And so we anticipate pulling on, um, we're, we're hiring right now and we're looking to just continue to expand. Yeah, did you ever think it would expand and grow into something like this? <laughs> no, I can, if I can just mention yeah. one thing. So spending this much time with the kids, we yeah. realized that academically there were a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. So we incorporated a scholars program into it. So a lot of what we do is all, all soccer based, all soccer family based, and a lot of it is education. So we also give money back to the kids. We take them on college visits. We help them with their FAFSA. But education is super huge because we don't want them to grow up without knowing what their true potentials are in life. Artisanal peanut butter, it's bee nutty, uh, multiple flavors. I've tasted a little bit, I can tell you it is uh, outstanding and growing in a big way, an outstanding business uh, as well. Joy Tompkins, also Carol Potelak, thank you both very, much. You very much. And good luck Thanks, going Gary. forward too. Thank you. Thank All right, you. you bet. Well, coming up, tourism in Northwest Indiana is big business, especially after the dunes or national park status earlier this year, a first for the state. We'll talk with Indiana Dunes Tourism Executive Director uh, about record crowds and what's ahead. Plus, there's a new a mantra and movement that's gaining traction here in the region. It's called the Grass is Greener in Indiana campaign. We'll explain uh, what it is and why it's specifically aimed at those living in neighboring Illinois. Stay with us.
Well, Northwest Indiana, the region, is a cultural melting pot, a very diverse and unique place, different than any other in Indiana. It is a, a city and a region with rich industrial heritage, one that is in transition. Northwest Indiana is the second largest regional economy in the state. Lake County, the second fastest growing economy in Indiana. And there are signs around the region of economic momentum. And Hammond, the Lear Corporation, moved into its new $30 million plant this year. Also, the Sportsplex is attracting thousands of visitors to that city. The Stadium District has been a focus in Whiting. And the Ileana Whiting LLC, a, a division of Holiday Properties, continues construction on a new five-story multi-use building at the former Ileana Hotel property. In East Chicago, the city gearing up for a major $40 million senior housing project. And the $4 million Fitzsimmons development opened this summer as well. And in Valparaiso, grants are funding some 14 neighborhood projects throughout the city. Everything from streetscape improvements to do playgrounds, tree plantings, all adding to quality of life in a city that has also uh, experienced a redeveloped downtown. Well, welcome back to this special edition of Inside Indiana Business from Northwest Indiana. Coming to you this week from the Mascot Hall of Fame in Whiting. Well, since receiving national park status, the Indiana Dunes National Park saw its highest visitor numbers ever this summer. The park consists of some 15,000 acres along the southern shore of Lake Michigan. And when the visitation numbers of uh, both the state park and national park are combined, the dunes ranks seventh in the nation in terms of visitation. In 2018, uh, even without the national park designation, 3.6 million visitors came to see the dunes. And with more on how the dunes national park uh, is doing and what it means to the region's economy, pleased to welcome back to the show Indiana Dunes Tourism Executive Director Lorelai Weimer. And uh, Lorelai, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having us back. Yeah, and it's uh, you've been busy. <laughs> a we lot have of, been very busy. A, a lot of attention. Uh, the dunes. I, I think we should start with that because even before this national park designation, the dunes was such a treasure and such an asset not only to Northwest uh, Indiana but the entire state. Give us the thumbnail description for those around the state, maybe who have not been to the dunes, and what an amazing place it is. Well, first of all, we're situated on Lake Michigan, which is a great lake, and a lot of people in Indiana don't realize we're connected to the Great Lakes. Um, and then within the Great Lakes is the, in Lake Michigan, is the Indiana Dunes, which are a beautiful area. And we have a lot, another thing that a lot of people don't realize is we do have the National and the State Park. Mm -hmm. So the State Park is actually surrounded by the National Park, and there's different access points. And one of the things that we're really known for within the dunes is the biodiversity, the beach experience, and our hiking trails. Yeah. Well, this is billed as is the birthplace of ecology, right? It's that is correct, and I think that's one of the gems that people don't realize. Uh, National Geographic said that we're the seventh most biodiverse place in the nation, and the reason for that is we're the crossroads of four different climates in this area, and that's what is causing the biodiversity. In fact, we just learned that um, we have more plant species and animal species than Yellowstone National Park, which is over two million acres of wow. land at Yellowstone. So that just tells you this gem that we have in Northwest Indiana. Well, and things uh, uh, really escalated in terms of the uh, the high profile nature uh, of the park with this national park designation, 61st national park in the country first, and only uh, in Indiana. That, uh, that happened in February. Talk about what that has meant for visitation. Well, it was a huge pleasant surprise when we learned this, the name change in February. So we didn't know what to expect. Had a lot of questions about visitation, economic impact, and, and our first response was, we don't know, we know. But around April, we started to realize that at the Visitor Center, which is the official Indiana Dunes Visitor Center, which is our organization and the National Park together, we started seeing that visitation was increasing. And just to give you a perspective, our average visitation, which is July, which is the busiest month of the year for us, we average around 20,000 visitors a year. This year we had 42,000. Wow. This is part uh, of a very, very important part of uh, the economy, and that's tourism and hospitality in the region. And one of the interesting uh, stories I see developing too is the prospect for a cruise ship right to actually make a stop uh, here in the region in, in Portage talk talk about where the idea came from and, and what the prospects are well you know we we were approached by the Northwest Indiana Forum and they've been a part of some Great Lakes initiatives and one of the things that started 20 years ago is cruise lines on the Great Lakes there are only two states 
that are connected to the Great Lakes that do not have cruise ships coming, and that's Minnesota mm -hmm. and the state of Indiana. Duluth is close to having their own uh, uh, cruise line, so that will leave Indiana as the sole state. So our organization is working to bring cruises to Indiana, and they would be coming to the Port of Indiana, which is in Portage, Indiana. And then it is our job to come up with itineraries and tours that they would be excited to get on a bus from the ships and go tour our destination, and that's what we're working on right now. And in terms of going forward, looking at ways to leverage that and to, to help uh, really spread that, uh, that impact throughout the region? Yes, and so that's the, what our goal is, is that we know that Dunes is the hook. It's what really identifies our destination and it's what drives visitation. But once we get them there, we want them to have a great Dunes experience, but then we say shake off the sand south of the Dunes mm -hmm. and we've got to get them into our community because that's our communities because that's where the real spending takes place. Executive Director of Indiana Dunes uh, Tourism, Laura Life, thank you very much. Thank you for having yeah, us again. Yeah, we'll look forward to having you on the show again. Great, thank you, take okay. care. While the Miller neighborhood in Gary, an eclectic lakefront community, has long been considered a, a region gem, from its quirky, independently owned businesses, breweries and restaurants, to a vibrant arts community. There are about 25 new businesses and new pop-up galleries and other community-driven events that have been spawned since the Miller Beach Arts and Creative District launch in 2011 in response to numerous business closings on Lake Street. Major construction as part of the Marquette plan is underway with sidewalks being widened, making it more pedestrian and bike friendly. Well, there is a move underway in the region with a simple message to those living in neighboring Illinois. The grass is greener in Indiana. It's a campaign to get Illinois residents, especially those who would normally gravitate to the Chicago suburbs, to move to Northwest Indiana. And the uh, Move to Indiana campaign is now in its second year and here to explain more about the initiative and reaction to it. And pleased as always to be joined by South Shore Convention and Visitors Authority CEO Spiro Baristados. And Spiro, as always, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. Okay, the grass is, is greener in Indiana. Uh, catchy name, how did it come about? Because this is not a, a traditional economic development uh, uh, initiative where you're trying to get a business to move, you're really targeting individuals, residents, right? We are. The conversation started between what we call the founding five, ourselves, the Times of Northwest Indiana, Centir, NIPSCO, and the Greater Northwest Indiana Association of Realtors. And we wanted to do something that would help grow the area, but you know, I've got hotels and restaurants and breweries, and I lived in Miller for 20 years, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. We've got to help grow that business, and you can do it with convention and visitors, and you can do it by growing your mm -hmm. uh, housing stock and your, yeah. your residency. So we looked at it and said, let's go. Uh, yeah. Let's start marketing. It was in the the times of a pop or soda tax in Chicago, a bag tax mm -hmm. in Chicago. Uh, now the new governor's come in and raised everything, every tax by 10%. Yeah. And so now you're talking about some real money coming out of your household if you live right. in Illinois. And it really, uh, with the messages of lower taxes, bigger mm -hmm. housing for the dollar, uh, our, you know, every tax where you do a head-to-head -head comparison, mm -hmm. we've, we have an environment that is truly competitive mm -hmm. in the Chicago market. Okay, talk about how it works because this is uh, mostly a digital marketing campaign uh, that you're targeting residents It's 99% digital. Uh, it's scary, spooky, big brother, you know, follows you. We did some geofencing, and if you're playing Candy Crush or checking Facebook, ads pop up. I don't know how it works. It's just, it's frightening. But it's very cool, great response. Our click-through rates are double or triple national averages. Uh, I'll be honest, I wish we could run tourism campaigns that were this effective. Uh, the messages are resonating. Every penny we put in goes entirely mm -hmm. to digital ads. We're real serious about this campaign and yeah. it's working. Well, you talk about it, it's working. Are people moving? Are they people are moving. moving if yeah. you look at the, the uh, housing starts in communities like Dyer, Munster, St. John, Cherville, uh, even Hammond, uh, Lowell, I mean, just everywhere where that Westlake corridor is going to be, you're seeing a movement uh, by either empty nesters or millennials or young, you know, millennials that are starting their families. We find those two are our big markets because they're downsizing. Well, you mentioned uh, the Westlake uh, you know, corridor there, so that extension of the, the South Shore line, uh, the double tracking, all that plays into this because of that connectivity to Chicago. Critical. I mean, we're, we're able to sell the fact that you can still have your job in Chicago. Uh, if you want to save time on your commute, you move to Indiana. Mm -hmm. If you want to have more time with your family, you move to Indiana. Uh, the quality of life here, the 61st National Park, mm -hmm. uh, big move for us in helping people understand what our assets and the open spaces look like here. So we've seen all of these things really help 
sell this, and they're all coalescing around this message of move to Indiana. And to add to that, the downtown redevelopment, the quality of life projects in places like Whiting and Valpo and some of these other areas, I guess that plays into it too, making it more attractive. Well, I'm glad you're here yeah. because Whiting didn't look like this the last time you were here. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you haven't been to some of our communities in the last five to seven years, I'll argue you've never been to them. Yeah. Uh, there's just real excitement uh, all along the South Shore right now, and it's it's infectious. Yeah. For me, it's fun after 30 years of work seeing mm -hmm. what's going on here, and, and we're just pleased to be a part of it. Sparrow Body Stados, thank My you friend, so much. You yeah, we're going to see you in a few minutes on the Insiders, too. You so. are. Stick around. And there's only one place in the country, uh, I should say, where you can find the Philly Fanatic, Bucky the Badger, and Casey Wolf all under one roof right here at the Mascot Hall of Fame. It's the newest attraction in the region. It's already having uh, economic impact as well. And Museum Executive Director Arrestus Hernandez will join us next. Stay with us. Well, you're looking at one of the most iconic symbols in the region, and for that matter, the entire state. It's the Michigan City Lighthouse and Pier, the only public operating lighthouse in Indiana. It was built more than 110 years ago. It is known for its distinctive raised walkway and red roof. The lighthouse closed in 1940, sat vacant for nearly 25 years, and suffered significantly from neglect and vandalism. The city of Michigan City took over the property and then leased it to the Michigan City Historical Society in 1965 to restore and establish a museum, which it opened in 73. Today, the pier is a popular spot for fishing, watching the sunset, and a favorite among photographers as well. Well, you see them on the sidelines, in the stands, or on the field or court. And uh, now the Mascot Hall of Fame honors these entertaining unsung heroes of sports and communities. The interactive exhibits are focused on STEAM-based education, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Executive Director Arrestus Hernandez joins us uh, now to explain how this unique venue is 25,000 square feet of fun for kids, adults, and sports fans. Arrestus, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And well, thanks for your hospitality, of too. Uh, and I think we have a visitor. Yeah, there he is, Reggie. Reggie, good to see you, my well, he's man. He's not really yeah. a visitor. He lives here. He lives here. Yes, he's that's the right. official mascot of the Mascot Hall of Fame. And you can tell he loves what he does. That's right. There's got to be pressure to be a mascot of the Mascot Hall of Fame. He is representing the best of the best. <laughs> uh, and uh, and, we, and when, we, when we bring those mascots here to make appearances, he's got to tidy up the place. That's good. So Good to know, see you, Reg. Go Thanks. Pick, go pick up your room. Thanks for being here, my man. All right, uh, <laughs> Rest, let's talk about the Hall of Fame. Unique venue, uh, certainly. We're, we're That's right. really glad to be here. It's a great, very colorful venue in Whiting, Indiana. How did this all come about? When you think about the butterfly effect and how things happen, uh, you got to go all the way back to July 2003. Uh, Randall Simon, who was a member of the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, he took a baseball bat to an Italian sausage uh, <laughs> during uh, the sausage a race. Mascot, the, a yeah, mascot, right, right, right? That is a big tradition in Milwaukee. And uh, that culminated in a mascot rights movement, right? And a few, days uh, a few years later, uh, because of that movement, Dave Raymond, who's the original Philly fanatic, uh, came up with this idea to found the Mascot Hall of Fame. He found it as a website and to honor and showcase the good works that mascots do uh, for communities throughout the country. And I know uh, he's re really looking to get a physical location for this and uh, Mayor Joe Stahura here That's in right. Whiting, right, took the initiative to call up and say, hey, can, can we get it here? That's right. So about four or five years ago, uh, Mayor Joe was kind of clued into this website and he, and he checked it out and he thought, you know, maybe it was a good fit. So the little tiny uh, 5,000 person city on the south shore of Lake Michigan is really known for pierogi fest and mm -hmm. kind of the quirky, you know, right. events that happen here around the city and, and the quirkiness of mascots really is a perfect fit. Uh, take us on a tour, if you will. What, uh, sure. did, tell us what this museum is all about. Your visit really begins when you, when you walk in the door and you look up and you see 19 four foot wide mascot balloon heads which are how we honor the Hall of Fame mascots. And so the premise of your visit is you're visiting Mascot University. You're here to learn what it takes to be a mascot in all the facets of being a performer. And so it starts with a six minute video that introduces you to this building, the city of Whiting, and why it's built here mm -hmm. in, uh, in Whiting, Indiana. And it walks you through the university experience, right? So you learn the science of silliness, the science behind mascotting. Uh, then you gotta learn a little bit of history. Then you, you come onto the area that we're in now uh, and you get to build 
a mascot in a variety of ways, uh, literally with Crayola markers, 2D, uh, old school, to uh, digital platforms where you can email yourself one of 498 billion options to make a mascot. Uh, and then you get to audition to be a mascot, and, uh, and that culminates in our uh, center sports court downstairs to you know, interact in the sports that, rep, that mascots represent, so. How about the business of this place? How has it been accepted? You're just coming up on a year in December, sure. so still mm -hmm. a very new uh, museum. We are the Hall of Fame of mascots for pro and, and college sports. Uh, soon to one day be the international, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hall of Fame for mascots, but we're doing that disguised as really the country's most unique uh, kids museum that's embedded uh, all the exhibits they're mascot themed, but they're embedded, like you mentioned, with STEAM level education. And so that's not just science, technology, the arts, engineering, mathematics, but you've got physics and geography and health and nutrition and the gamut of, of topics that children from K through eight need to learn. And when we opened, it took about a month to realize that we're also teaching adults that it's okay to be a kid for a couple hours. Yeah, it is a fun place. That's right. Arrestus uh, Hernandez, the executive director here at the uh, Mascot Hall of Fame. Thanks for joining us. Reggie, appreciate you as well. This guy's a ham, you know it? Yeah. He's a ham. Good to see you, Arrestus. Well, stick around. We'll dive into a special insiders panel. Reggie will not be on the insiders panel. They'll weigh in on the state of the economy here in Northwest Indiana. Hot topics at quality of place, workforce development, the South Shore Extension. Stay with us. Well, the Port of Indiana Burns Harbor is one of three statewide ports located on Lake Michigan and situated on two major North American freight transportation arteries, the Great Lakes and the Inland Waterway System. The state's three port system serves uh, really one of the world's most productive industrial and agricultural regions. The port is uh, also currently in the middle of a $20 million expansion here. 600 uh, acre port also home to more than 30 companies. And one day could be, uh, become a destination for cruise ships with tourists to explore northwest Indiana. And it's time now for a special edition of The Insiders. This week we're talking all things northwest Indiana, from the Westlake Corridor Project to the focus on getting more people to move from, uh, uh, to Indiana from Illinois to how the region is stepping up its workforce development game. And I'm pleased to be joined by Gary Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson, also NIPSCO Economic Development Director Don Babcock, and South Shore Convention and Visitors Authority President and CEO Spiro Baristados. And uh, welcome one and all to the Insiders. Thank, Thank you for having us. And uh, Mayor, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, and you'll be leaving office at the end of the year. You're going to head up the Chicago Urban League, so a yes. big job for you. But you have uh, will be wrapping up two uh, terms, uh, eight years. You've seen a lot in Gary in the region. How would you assess uh, the state of the region as we sit here today? I think the state of the region is very strong. I think we have come together uh, cohesively in a way to focus on our assets, namely our commuter rail through the Westlake and the investment on the double tracking, tourism. You see uh, we're here in the Mascot Hall of Fame. We have really leveraged our lakeshore, the recreational side at Marquette Park and Gary and Portage and Michigan City all along the lakefront. And so I think that we are working together extremely well and it's really working to the benefit of all residents. Do, do you sense that things are beginning to come together uh, that maybe uh, weren't happening to bef before? Collaboration, cooperation, some of these things you talked about are now beginning to get that snowball effect going. Oh, that's absolutely the case. I think once one thing is that we have the leadership of a very engaged congressman. He has been working hard to provide infrastructure and other things that we need here in Northwest Indiana from Washington, because you have to have a partner in the federal government. But you also have organizations like NERPC, like the Regional Development Authority, and like the South Shore Convention and Visitors Association. All of those organizations are working together so that everyone from Northwest Indiana uh, is sort of on the same page. Ms. Spiro, uh, Mayor talked about uh, you know talent attracting people from Illinois. I know you're engaged in that in a big way among other projects. I would, but before we leave this topic, I would be remiss if I didn't point out, and, and the mayor is always too humble and too much of a team player, but if the congressman were here, he'd tell you the very first person, the very first city on board 
with Westlake and the double track expansion was Gary. Mm -hmm. And you could have made an argument that said, well, we could prioritize our money differently, we have needs. And you know what, from the day one, Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson saw what's good for the region is good for Gary and vice versa. And mm -hmm. to her credit, jumps in as a team player. So it's not just an observation. She's lived that throughout her career in this region. I particularly appreciate, even from day one, her focus on inclusion and respect for diversity mm -hmm. and so. different points of view in terms of how to advance the region and move the place forward. Well, well, let's talk I about the, the connectivity because it's so important for all parts of the state. But Sparrow, I'll uh, begin with you. On you know, I, the, the, the move to Indiana is being is incredibly successful. Sure. We've been very fortunate. We have a number of municipalities coming in, seeing that it pays to advertise what's going on along those investments that are being uh, driven uh, multiple layers of government. And we're seeing housing starts happening all over Crown Point, Cherville. It's just the, the housing stock in that side of the county is going crazy. I, I'm going to challenge everybody to take a fresh look at what's going on uh, in the region on the South Shore because there are hidden secrets and gems everywhere. Yeah. Uh, not just in the, the communities uh, that you know you hear about all the time. Spiro's absolutely right. I've in fact talked to a number of insurance agents who have said we are doing just incredible business, renters, people who are purchasing homes in the city of Gary who want a quieter lifestyle, who want more of a family oriented life and they are looking all over Northwest Indiana, including Gary. Don, it would seem all these things coming together, right. uh, the South Shore extension in a long time coming, 30 plus years maybe. Oh, easy. Uh, is that, yeah. <laughs> and I was around when we first, my, my mom actually <laughs> rode the South Shore from Highland, I'm sorry, from East Chicago, Indiana. We grew up in Highland, yeah. little 746 square foot home. But she's the poster child of, and I'm the product of that, of being a little bitty house, drove every day to the South Shore Station in East Chicago, catching a train to Chicago for a better job, bringing the money home and raising yeah. three kids. Sure. And yeah. I'm a Purdue Northwest Indiana grad, first of my family to go to college. As you look at the perception of the region too, all these things you're talking about right. here, that perception outside of Northwest Indiana to people looking here, it's a different, seems like it's a region in transition. Well, that's well it has changed, so I have to give the, I haven't done this yet, but good afternoon, Northwest Indiana. <laughs> I sure and, hope this is running in the afternoon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I, I do that routinely because I think one of the ways to change communities is you really hang around with good people, people that believe in each other, so listen to the naysayers relative to when they have something worthwhile to incorporate in the plan. Sure. But at the end of the day, you got to stay with the yaysayers. And we have a lot of yaysayers now in Northwest Indiana. We used to be pretty much described as the Rust Belt, and we're moving very much to the Green Belt. Well, and you talk about the National Park designation oh, uh, for this. That's what does huge. that mean for this, the region? We are very proud of yeah. it. <laughs> there are 426 national something or others. Lake shores, seashores, through, you, know, you name it. There's 26 different monikers of national places. The funny thing is, is that nothing changed here. We didn't get any more money. The boundaries didn't grow. There aren't any more park rangers. One little four letter word, park. Took us from one of 426 to one of 61. Mm -hmm. And the cachet that that word brings with it, we saw this year uh, throughout the region, Lake Porter, Laporte, all of us saw incredible, because the park touches all three of our counties. Uh, we saw incredible visitation numbers, record setting years. Uh, now we just keep working on spending. I want you to come in and visit the park, but I don't yeah. want you driving home right away. Right, right, uh, right. So we have an opportunity to parlay uh, from that national park into national brands of gaming loyalty and recognition uh, that we didn't have before. While, while we had some pieces of the puzzle which were doing great, uh, we are not going to have that hard rock brand. And I'll let you kind of take it from yeah, there. I mean, that's just. seconds, Mayor. That's incredible to have mm -hmm. a partner in hard rock, to have it on the 8094 corridor. Mm -hmm. It will take not just gaming, but development related uh, and unrelated assets light years. It will right, become well, a more of a destination, that's really what it will become destination. a destination. Entertainment, rest, I mean, it's just all, you know, all of them, again, we have great casino partners throughout the region, we so do. I, I don't want we any, you know, do. this is just a final feather in that cap of yes. great entertainment, live entertainment, uh, and a brand but, that, you know, And we're going to get to linger longer, so right. come yeah. to visit and stay. Yes. You've got a future in hospitality. If you're <laughs> he does, he does. Right.
<laughs> With that, we'll put a wrap uh, on another edition of the Insiders. Uh, Gary Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson, thank you. Good luck in your new thank uh, you. endeavor, your next uh, chapter, Spiro Batistados, also Don Babcock. Hey, thank thanks, you for Gary. being here. Great and job. Thank That's you glad for to being have you here. up in the region. It's thanks. It's great so, to be thank here. Thanks for being here. And we'll be right back after this. Stay with us. And before we wrap up this special edition of our show, we want to give a special thank you to the Mascot Hall of Fame here in Whiting for their warm hospitality and sharing their really incredible space with us this week. Uh, also, the Indiana Regional Development Authority and the Times of Northwest Indiana are partners there for providing some great information and very important resources. As always, a big thank you as well to our friends and colleagues at WFYI for all of their efforts in making this a first-class production. And thank you for joining us on this special Roadshow edition of Inside Indiana Business from Northwest. Indiana. I'm Gary Dick. Go out and make it a successful week. Inside Indiana Business with Gary Dick is a production of Grow Indiana Media Ventures with support from WFYI Productions.